from the Hearst Museum and um, someone who was brought on recently to do the important work of bringing education out of uh, those contacts from the museum out to a broader public, doing those kinds of engagements that we know that anthropology has to, has to do. And having our colleagues from the Hearst with us um, on a regular basis, we're reminded that the relationship that we have as a community of archaeologists here at the ARF is one um, that you know, oftentimes we may take for granted that we have the, you know, a million and one dissertations in that, in that museum. But moreover, we have um, a real community of academics who work really hard at what they do, who, who really support us in ways that many of us um, don't quite understand in all of its intricacies yet, but are really important. Uh, and that if you haven't spent the time to, to meet some of our colleagues in the museum, that you really are shortchanging yourselves and all the opportunities that those working relationships could have for you as an up-and-coming scholar. So I really wanted, especially for the, the, the younger academics in the room, push you to reach out to our colleagues in the museum who have been a, a tremendous part of my experience here at Berkeley and many of the faculty around you. So, um, Adam, uh, Dr. Nelson uh, comes to us uh, from Stanford, but we still like him. And uh, he's, you know, been brought specifically to do the work that uh, the Hearst in its new reimagined state and with this, with this new emphasis on um, what the museum can be in a broader community beyond our campus, beyond the academy, um, he's at the, at the tip of the spear and all that. So um, it's with great pleasure and a huge honor with all the Hearst community here in the room to welcome them to our brown bag. Thank you, June, and it's great to be here and see this nice, chill crew. I like a brown bag vibe that's a little bit more uh, laid back than some talks. Um, so yeah, a few different things to, and I think I might like occasionally sit here. Um, seen some of this um, before, some of this material about um, what is going on in the uh, development of our new gallery, but hopefully with some updates and with some additions, because I've uh, wanted to kind of tell you about multiple aspects of the work that I do um, at the Hearst that I haven't, I don't think I've shared with my Hearst colleagues all that much even. So um, yeah, so just to give you an overview of sort of the topics that I'm hoping to talk about today. Um, and I welcome your feedback and your questions at any point to just keep this totally um, chill and open. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a brief background about myself and the research that I do. I'm going to give you, um, some of you guys might not be familiar with the Hearst. Some of you guys might be um, early grad students who have never actually set foot into the Hearst. Um, I think that's probably very likely. So. Um, I can give you a brief background of the Hearst. Um, I know many of you guys here, I see many faces who uh, most certainly know the Hearst a million times better than I do, so I invite you to chime in. Um, and then some details about our new gallery and the renovation project that we're working on and the inaugural exhibit. And then um, at the end, I want to get your vibe on what I've talked about and what I've said, uh, get your feel for how we can make, um, make this gallery, uh, make this museum really, uh, the public face of this museum be something that is uh, really engaging for uh, both academics and non-academics. Um, that's of course a challenge to sort of play, um, have both of those kinds of voices. So um, I and hope to kind of get you thinking about new ways, thinking about ways in which um, everyday visitors, people who come to the Hearst who might not have the sort of background that we do, um, think about objects and think about um, people of other times and places. So like June said, so just to give you a vibe um, about, and I promise I won't keep saying the word vibe. Um, <laughs> that's two so far. Um, <laughs> just to give you a feel for where I'm coming from, um, like you said, yes, I come from Stanford. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, <laughs> in a previous talk that I gave to undergrads, I put the logo in black and white um, just to not freak anyone out. But it was told by a fellow Stanford alum, why are you doing that? So um, start off, so my, my more distant background, my undergrad, my master's from NYU are in anthropology. So, um, so I come from that sort of early, um, early academic background, doing research um, in those previous academic 
experiences in museums and looking at um, various ways in which stories of migration are told in museums. Um, after my time at NYU, I um, came back and I was a history researcher and curator at the Oakland Museum. Have people been to the Oakland Museum before? Oh, awesome, okay, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Um, and had a wonderful experience there during their complete renovation of their California History Gallery when everything was um, gutted and being completely rethought in a similar way to which the Hearst is currently being completely rethought. That got me very interested in, um, actually that's kind of out of order I need to have. So I actually went back to Stanford for my PhD because um, I got very interested in how people learn and think about um, people of the past specifically and um, how they how people learn in free choice learning settings like museums where they're not fed so much curriculum from a textbook but where people have um, you know very we're, we're learning is something that you can really customize but based on your own curiosity and your own interest and um, and I am super happy to have um, arrived here at the Hearst. I just had my, my six month mark last week. So um, it, time has breezed by and I've been loving it because this uh, position as head of education really combines what I love to do in terms of anthropology, in terms of educational research, and um, in terms of the creative aspects of museum work. Mm -hmm. um, I first want to just give you a, uh, a, a I was about to say vibe. Um, <laughs> I want to give you a feel for the sort of research that I do. Um, so my, one of my really deep interests is how people think and put their, themselves in the mind, the minds of people who, who they perceive to be different from themselves, specifically how they empathize with people who they feel, who they perceive to be different, and how they put themselves in the perspective of those people. Um, in doing that in museums, one of the, um, the pieces that I, or one of the um, kind of pairs of museum theorists museum learning theorists that I continually come back to uh, and that I just want to tell you about real quick that kind of guides the work that I do is um, someone with an impossible name, Csikszent Mihai, um, and Hermansen, Mihai Csikszent Mihai being um, a Hungarian educational researcher who does really awesome studies in, on museum learning. Um, and in the work that I do at the Oakland Museum and here, we, we um, try to think in, th in three kind of different ways based on their research. Um, about how visitors learn and what draws visitors in. Previously, um, you know, museum learning was ten, uh, museum professionals tended to not even think about the visitors and not really think much about, the, uh, about what visitors were actually doing in their galleries. It was just a matter of we present the material and we hope, you know, material we think people should learn and present it in the way we think they learn, but paying very little attention to what people are actually doing. So, so thinking in terms of what, what are ways that um, visitors get hooked in? What are ways that you can draw visitors in um, by creating curiosity um, and specifically my interest in relating to people of different times and places, um, making really clear the, li the links uh, between people, uh, between modern day people, modern day visitors, and people of different times and places, and, um, and using lots of stories, lots of first person narratives and faces to uh, bring that content to life. Uh, looking at ways for getting um, visitors involved in, the, in, in their museum visit, are actively involved instead of uh, just this, this transmission model of learning that still seems to pervade classrooms and informal learning environments like museums. So instead of having the, this idea that information is just going to be fed to visitors and they're just going to absorb it, um, Op, op, looking for opportunities to involve them, so ways that they can discover material and put pieces together themselves, um, um, immersive environments, this, um, this idea that, uh, and something that we're very much um, working on at the Hearst is, is conveying this idea that um, even though museums may, material in museums may seem to descend from, from the academic heavens onto the walls, and you may not even think about, uh, about the credibility or how this knowledge was arrived at, um, getting visitors to think in terms of, to, to think about the, the contestedness of knowledge and how knowledge gets creative and how created and how there may be multiple, multiple perspectives on particular, um, particular themes. And then this idea that they have about flow, 
the um, creating conditions for and, and flow it's such an everyday word but it's very heavily theorized by especially Chiksen Mahai and other um, academic uh, other educational researchers and I'm, I really like this way of thinking about how can we produce opportunities for visitors or learners in any environment to, to get in this sort of zone, in this sort of zone of flow, um, as they say, where, where you're, um, you, you kind of forget the world around you and you're so immersed and you're so interested. And the, um, the challenge level and the, um, the, the level of challenge and the level of novelty of the, um, of the experience is a, is a good, is a, the ideal match to your actual abilities. So, so making it so that people are just challenged enough by, um, by working with new information or with, with new content so that they are, they're immersed and they're interested. So various ways that have been heavily, um, that have been extensively worked on by these theorists are, are in, in the context of museums are the importance of orienting visitors to a museum and orienting them to a space so that when visitors enter a museum, they have a feel for what they're about to experience and how they might like to, um, how they might best be able to, um, what sorts of questions and what sorts of uh, ways of, of making the material relevant to them, the best ways that they might be able to think that to sort of prime their, uh, their, them for their visit. And, and looking for ways to sort of make museums comfortable and make them cozy and make them places where they're not going to be distracted by, um, you know, by negative mental states, they're not going to be frustrated. They're not going to be tired of standing. They're not going to be um, confused. And where they where they make soulful connections, as they say, uh, that are not just about um, about sort of cognitive processes, but they're actually making emotional connections and and having their emotions raised by uh, by the material in the museums. So to give you. Um, a little description of the work that I've done previously and that I, that, um, that I was doing right before I started my work here, um, I, I went back to the Oakland Museum and did work, um, did some research on how visitors are engaging with their um, new approaches to, uh, to museum learning. And the, um, the, the kind of guiding ethos of the Oakland Museum of this, the renovation process um, that Something that guide, the idea that guided the renovation process at the Oakland Museum was that people connect, like I was saying, with faces and voices and stories of, of real people. And so I was very interested in, well, what are people actually doing when they encounter those? Especially um, the secondary guiding ethos is how um, is minimizing curatorial text, minimizing the amount of text um, written by this omniscient curator who is telling you the way the world is or, or what the facts are. But um, at, at the Oakland Museum, much of the material is told in, in voices of first, uh, first person voices of real people who were there um, from diaries and letters and um, interviews. So, um, so visitors are sort of having to piece together these individual stories uh, and voices to create their own narrative understanding of what, um, of what particular past, of what a particular era was like. And so I did part of my dissertation research on one exhibit that really, um, that really highlights or that, that especially uses that approach, which was the, um, the Coming for Gold, the California Gold Rush exhibit in the California History Gallery. And so you see when you walk into this exhibit, you are, one of the first things you see is a wall of, of faces that were intentionally picked to be very diverse uh, with the idea that um, a diver the diverse range of, of visitors to the museum would be able to connect. And so yeah, those faces, uh, lots of um, first person quotes. This was a little scrapbook where people are looking through and, and they can read um, diary excerpts and see photos of real people. And another image, this right here is a, oh, I do have a pointer. Um, that right there, it, you can't really tell, but it's a life-size um, screen with an actress who retells stories that are excerpted from, um, from diaries and from letters. So you, you push a button and she comes out and she, she tells you, she retells these stories. Um, so another way of creating this opportunity for personal, conne personal connection. So in my research and um, <laughs> what I did was I, um, you can't really tell because of the lighting, but that's a, a GoPro camera on, 
on uh, this woman's forehead. She was one of the participants in, in my study. And um, I've not yet used that GoPro camera for anything other than this study. Um, I look forward to scuba diving or something with it, but <laughs> right now it's just purely my research tool. And um, what I was interested in looking at was how, how is a person going through this exhibit um, linking together all these voices and stories and, and, um, and tying it into um, a new understanding of the gold rush period. And so I had a number of, I had a dozen visitors um, do this process and giving me a stream of consciousness as they're going through. And I've, I'm able to analyze the video uh, the video of what they're looking at and, and combine that with what they're saying, uh, with their thoughts that they're, that they're expressing as they're seeing the material, and look at various ways, um, in, look into ways in which their feelings of connection with these stories, this vague idea of connection, what does that mean? Um, connection with these stories um, relates to how they're actually learning about the period. I gave them a, a sign, of course, so people wouldn't think they're you know crazy, like talking to themselves in the gallery. Um, and so I could, I could talk about this research for a long time. I just wanted to give you a little, a little um, taste of it. But some implications that, that I really want to bring to the Hearst from this work, and that I, hope to, I actually hope to carry out similar studies at the Hearst, um, are just a more, more nuanced view of what this idea of connection is, um, what that actually looks like and what it means. Because my feel is that a lot of museums these days are sort of willy-nilly putting, you know, just thinking the key to, you know, the key to learning is just put up more voices, put up more stories, just, you know, get, a, get some diverse faces um, and put them up and people are going to connect. Um, in my research, I'm fleshing out what that actually means and looks like. Um, I'm also re trying to kind of raise that as a concern and, um, and also raising the concern that a lot of visitors in my study um, and, and, and in other studies too have, have expressed frustration with the lack of curatorial text. So this sort of movement away from, uh, from curators telling stories actually seems to be frustrating for a lot of visitors. But um, it's a delicate balance, of course, between overwhelming visitors with, uh, with text and, um, and um, giving them, but also giving them space, um, space to breathe and space to make their own connections. So um, that's something I want to pursue further is to figure out what is that balance and how can we um, sort of optimize visitors' experience with, the, with these sorts of stories. And of course, the idea that's not, uh, not new, but the idea that um, kind of fleshing out and reflecting more on the idea of that not everything works for all visitors, that um, some visitors, you know, really want their, their curatorial text. Some people don't want it. Some people want, you know, don't care about the object. Some people only care about the, you know, about the, the graphics. So what are ways in which we can create um, exhibits that are going to speak to a, a wide range of, of types of visitors? So things that I'm hoping to bring to the Hearst. Now, now turning specifically to the Hearst. And, um, so people may, I'm kind of, kind of going to zoom this, zoom through this, because I think that people, a lot of people probably already do know a thing or two about the Hearst Museum. But um, um, Ira Jackness, who, I, who is a um, research anthropologist at the Hearst Museum, knows the museum backwards and forwards. And I have learned a great deal about the museum from him. So please correct me if I'm getting anything wrong, Ira. Um, but so Phoebe Hearst, um, early patron and uh, one of the founders of the, um, of the Hearst Museum, who um, was uh, formerly called the Lowy Museum. Uh, so yeah, one of the early pa the founders of the museum, who is the mother of William Randolph Hearst, and who, um, who set about uh, with a number of projects of collecting objects from around the world and sending, uh, sending researchers on expeditions to um, excavate and collect uh, Phoebe in, um, in Egypt. Some of the early images of objects that were collected um, in Egypt. This, I believe, um, these are objects in the collection, I believe, when the museum was located in San Francisco, right? Yes. Um, another example is um, archaeologist Max Uli, who, um, who was commissioned to set out to Peru and, um, and to excavate and, and bring back collections that com comprise a significant, uh, they're one of the more significant and larger collection, uh, portions of the collection. Um, so we have a beautiful collection of objects from, um, from Peru. And I think a lot of people are familiar with the, um, the relationship between Ishii and the museum. Ishii, um, a Yahi Indian who, um, who 
was, became a friend of Alfred Kroeber and who, uh, who was kind of an informant and a person who created objects uh, for, for the museum and worked with the museum um, and actually lived at the museum during a period. And so um, part of it, we do have many objects that were created, um, such as this um, arrowhead that was created uh, out of glass, actually, by Ishii. Um, the museum in 1959 moved to um, the building across the, just across the way. So um, yeah, it doesn't look too much different except for the cars, right? Um, and you'll notice the totem pole, the 40-foot totem pole that was removed, I believe, was it the 90s? 80. 80. In 1980? OK, yes, uh, so the totem pole was, um, was removed and is currently at our um, facility in Richmond. Um, but so moved into, into, um, the, into Kroeber in um, 1959. And the gallery space in there is um, about 6,200 square feet. So uh, it's a little bit of a, um, ironic that we have this massive collection of about 3.8 million objects and this very small gallery space. And just some quick images that give a little bit more feel for um, objects in the collection and just what the museum looked like before, um, before it closed um, for renovation. And another big, um, big thing going on under the Hearst is the um, massive move of our collections. Um, I, I believe it was five collections facilities or five, five locations. Is that right, Jane? Five um, locations in which um, Hearst objects were scattered and are now being consolidated into, um, into two, uh, two facilities. So it's been a massive project that, uh, that has taken um, a great deal of, of time and um, expert energy from, from our staff and, uh, and our new facilities, are, uh, especially our, I mean, our Richmond facility, which is our, our newer one, is quite beautiful. And it's kind of a kid in, the can kid in the candy store experience to go through and walk the aisles of these amazing objects. So ways in which we're rethinking. So now, now specifically turning to the gallery renovation project and, um, and what we're working on to renovate the space and make the space a new, give the, the space a new feel and what the inaugural exhibit is going to look like um, when we reopen. Um, the, speaking of reopening and the timeline, we're, um, the timeline for all of this that I'm about to talk about is um, that we plan on, on opening in December slash January. So um, probably having like a soft opening in January, uh, December and having our grand reopening in January. Did I say that right? Soft opening December, big opening January. Um, so yeah, so multiple ways in which we're rethinking the museum sort of based on the ideas I was talking about. Um, making this a place where we have a lot of community participation and where it's not just um, scholars kind of uh, feeding or, or, um, or transmitting um, knowledge um, to visitors, but where, uh, where visitors are actually um, involved in that process, where we involve uh, visitors or community members in the process of, of curating exhibits and of, of helping us to assemble exhibits um, using their own expert knowledge of a different sort, um, making it a place that's very interactive, lots of um, links between on-campus and off-campus. So we have all this amazing research happening here at Cal, so um, it seems worthwhile to, to make tighter links between us and the community surrounding us. Um, connections to every, the lives of everyday visitors, and this is something I really want to get your feel about at the end of, of my talk, is, is um, after you've seen all this, how you, what, ways in which you feel that we can really take this material and make it very relevant and really get visitors thinking like anthropologists. And the space is going to be really flexible so that it's not something where you walk in, you know, month after month after month, or don't walk in month after month after month because um, we, don't, we don't want it to be a, sta a place that's uh, stagnant, but where we can very easily rotate new objects in and out and uh, where we will have the capacity to do things like pop-up exhibits or, um, or other programming that's going to keep the gallery fresh and new feeling and updated. Um, 
I've kind of talked a little bit about this, but mul various ways in which we're looking at community participation, uh, having ways of evaluating our material from the start or throughout the process of, ex of exhibit development. So taking our initial ideas and going to our community and doing sort of front end and formative evaluation. If we want to do an exhibit on X, how are, uh, how, is the, how are community members, how are non-academics thinking about X in the world? What sorts of questions do they have? What sorts of um, of thoughts that they have and how can that guide the way that we design the exhibit and prototyping those exhibits, um, those ideas as we go forward and, and doing mock-ups of, of our displays and seeing do these make sense? Are visitors totally bored? Are they totally fascinated? Do they, um, do they have questions that we didn't think about? Co-curation opportunities like, we, like I mentioned and um, including uh, real people's uh, voices and stories. So bringing in perspectives of everyday, um, everyday people from outside of the museum staff. And some new learning goals also. Um, encouraging, looking at ways to encourage visitors to, to um, use tools of anthropologists in, the, in their everyday lives. This idea of open questions like I kind of mentioned, and questioning our own ways and reflecting on our own ways of thinking and feeling and acting in our own lives. Um, several new, so how many people have, I guess how many people have not been into the Hearst before, into the actual, oh, only a few, okay. Okay, a okay. handful. So, um, so some of this, I'll show you a little diagram. Some of it um, you might kind of have to know, have, might have to have been in there to, to know, but we're relocating the entrance, uh, which was formerly, uh, you had to go into the lobby of Kroeber Hall to enter the museum, but we're shifting the entrance to the, uh, to the Bancroft side of the building so that the museum will have a little bit more of a public face. We're going to have walls that are movable that aren't just fixed in place like, um, like previously had been the case. So walls that um, have a wheel system, and we're trying to figure out the logistics of this right now. But um, we're excited that that's definitely going to happen where we can um, shift. I mean, it's amazing what just moving a wall or two does to change the look and feel of a space. So that's going to be a good way of keeping the gallery very fresh feeling, um, new cases. Um, new furniture, floor, ceiling, lighting, I mean, a complete overhaul, um, even down to those micro levels. And then um, a new learning center uh, in what was formerly the, the gift shop. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, this is the floor plan, which you might, so if you've been in there, in, in the gallery before, you'll kind of recognize. So this is the door that goes into the lobby of Krober. And we're going to be moving the door right there to, so this is Bancroft right here. So the new, uh, new entrance is going to be right there on Bancroft. Um, we have a welcome area, a, kind of an introductory and orientation area. And, um, and then this is what we're working with right now as the, um, as the layout, the possible layout for how our mobile walls are going to be. Each little chunk of these, uh, of this little uh, configuration, each little chunk is going to be a wall that we can shift around. And this is um, Learning Center, which I'll show you, and our um, storage space. Uh, we, had a, we have this um, drawing that we love um, showing some of the possibilities of what's going to be um, possible in this Learning Center, where, uh, where we want to make it equipped with a variety of technologies that will be useful for, uh, for faculty and students and engaging with the collections. So uh, we're working on doing that right now. And some of you may have done our survey about, uh, about ways in which, uh, asking about ways in which this Learning Center can best serve faculty and, and students in their teaching and learning. So there will be a variety of ways for faculty to, to um, have objects pre-selected that can be displayed in this learning center so that students can come and study them on their own time. Uh, we're looking at um, various uh, sort of visualization um, technologies and the like, and also having it be a space where we can, the, the gallery will be flexible, but this will be super flexible where we can, uh, where we can bring in, um, create exhibits kind of on the fly that are really responsive to things going on in the world. Um, that are, are really current, current events or current issues or current research that, um, where we can have these pop-up exhibits. 
And so one of the first objects, so now kind of shifting to the layout of the, of the gallery as you walk in, um, one of the, the object that's going to be sort of welcoming you when you come into the gallery is um, a fellow known as the doctor. Do people know about the doctor? Yeah? OK. People probably are familiar with our crowdfunding um, campaign um, back in the fall. But the doctor is um, our affectionate name for a um, a 2,500-year-old, um, 6,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds, 7,000 pounds, six, seven, seven, seven okay, 7,000 pounds um, sarcophagus lid um, that is uh, in impeccable shape and belonged to um, a guy named um, Somatic, who was, we know from uh, being able to read the hieroglyphs, which are beautiful, we know that he was a doctor, and so we call him the doctor. And we had a really exciting and successful crowdfunding campaign back in the fall, like I mentioned, where we, uh, we, went, we were able to raise over and above our goal um, for uh, all that's involved in getting the, the doctor to our gallery. So um, this is going to cover things like transporting the doctor from our Richmond facility to, um, to the museum and building new, um, new mount, a new mount for him uh, and new interpretive material for him and getting the, I mean, he's massive, 7,000 pounds. So, so there's going to be a lot of work to, to make it possible for him to actually just be in the gallery. So, um, so the, doctor will, the doctor will see you now, um, as we said in our campaign. And um, so he will be there welcoming you at the opening of the, um, at the welcome area of the gallery. So, so now to turn to the inaugural exhibit that we're working on, um, the first exhibit that will be open when we, um, when we reopen. And right now, we're calling the, um, the exhibit the Language of Objects. And um, this is the, so things could change. Things are in, sort of in flux. And we're having a lot of conversations about this right now. I'll be interested to hear your feedback on, on these ideas. The basic idea behind this opening exhibit um, is that we are are looking to get visitors thinking like anthropologists, like I mentioned, and thinking about objects in, in the way that anthropologists or archaeologists think about objects um, in three different ways, three different aspects. So materiality, the materiality of objects, what objects are made of, and how, um, how raw materials are manipulated. Authenticity, what makes objects real or not real, and what does that mean, and why does that matter? And context, um, what, what can we gain from the lens of looking at objects and thinking about the context in which they are or were used or found or displayed? So three different lenses. Um, a new development in our plan for the gallery is that um, one of the, the, main, uh, the main sets of objects that you're going to see as you walk in the door after you go through the welcome area where the doctor will be. Um, we are proud of our collection of um, Taiwanese opera puppets. Um, I believe there are about 200 of them. And they're uh, a beautiful set of, um, object of puppets used in Taiwanese puppet operas. And um, so beautiful colors, um, some bizarre and really cool shaped faces, really fascinating to look in the eyes of these objects, and, um, and just the range of, of different designs and colors. And our hope is to be able to get all of these into, um, in, as the introductory objects in the gallery, and to use them as a way to get visitors right from the start, thinking about the three different lenses. What can we, what can we get out of looking at the materiality of these objects, what they're made of? What does that tell us? What can we get out of um, thinking about authenticity and how does that relate to these objects? And, um, and the context of, of these objects, where, um, who they belong to, um, the time and place in which they are made, what their um, function is. So um, really cool intro objects that we're excited about. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple brief examples of the, um, the three different themes and objects that we're going to display for the three different th themes. Anyone have any questions so far? at all. I've been talking for a little while now, so people cool? OK. So to launch right in, um, section one and materiality, happy to be able to um, have someone in the room who is helping us with, um, with one of the sets of objects in this collection. Um, we're really excited to be working with Carolyn Smith, who uh, a lot of you might know and who is a student here. Yeah, Karen. Uh, who's a student here in the anthropology department, and um, 
and is doing her, um, her, her PhD work on um, basket weaving on the Klamath River. And one of the stories that we're excited to be telling in the gallery, um, well, objects that we're going to be displaying, are, are um, Karuk baskets that were collected by Krober. And the story with these objects, which I, I really love, is um, the way, so Krober collected these, these baskets, um, but it was um, Lila O'Neill, um, anthropologist in the 1920s, who um, Krober had kind of just collected the baskets as, as objects or as, you know, kind of static and, and um, representations of this culture without really looking too much into, um, into the meaning behind these baskets or the design of these baskets. Lila O'Neill, who was um, a pioneer in the ethno-aesthetics movement, uh, went back to the Klamath River with these baskets, with pictures of these baskets, and interviewed people on the Klamath River about um, the aesthetics of these baskets, what made these baskets, uh, particular baskets, uh, beautiful or not beautiful, or well-made or not well-made. She, she was getting to what, what is the sort of deeper cultural significance of these, of these baskets. And, um, and so Carolyn's work is really interesting where she, so Lila O'Neill wrote a, a, a book about this that has become a very respected and, and beloved book among basket weavers on, on the Klamath River. And Carolyn is, um, is going back, or has been going back to the Klamath River and is interviewing modern day basket weavers about their relationship to, um, to this book and to the, to the work of Lila O'Neill and ways in which the book has a lot of modern day significance in terms of um, a, a source of pride, a source of um, family connection, a source of con connection to the past, and, um, and as, a, as a guidebook, as, as something that they can actually um, teach and learn with. So, um, so this, so this kind of an example of the, this materiality theme of looking at these baskets, um, research that looks at these baskets beyond just physical material objects, but um, ways in which they, they were made and ways in which people think about them. Um, also under materiality, we raise the question um, that, that I think is very interesting about how most of our collection, we have no idea the individual, we don't know nothing about the individuals who made most of the objects in our collection, but there are a few exceptions to that. And we're going to be highlighting those exceptions and, look, and, and getting visitors to think about, uh, you know, relating this to objects in their, in their own lives and who, you know, things, all, all the stuff in the room, do we know who made it? and, and why does that matter, and why uh, why is that interesting? And so this is a um, an example of a um, of a staff from the Yoruba of um, of West Africa, and this staff is used called a shango staff, shango staff, and is used in ceremonies that uh, are are worshiping, uh, where individuals are worshiping the, this, uh, the goddess um, Shango, and this staff is carried in parts of, in, in those ceremonies. Um, the story behind this is that uh, one of our uh, previous directors, Bascom, went, uh, was in this area and was hoping to purchase one of these staffs that was on an altar and that was being used in, in ceremony. And um, he was hoping to purchase it, but um, he was told, no, this is, you know, you can't purchase this, but we can, I can direct you to someone who can make one for you. And so as a result, um, Bascom, he, he didn't just collect the object, but he did a lot of um, interviewing and photographing and work with the maker of it, um, who was an individual named Duga. So we get, um, with this particular object, as opposed to most of the objects in our collection, we get to know not only about the object, but about who made it. And under the authenticity section, we'll be juxtaposing uh, masks uh, from the the Fong um, from the Fong of West Africa. And um, in the collection, we have one that's real and one that's fake. And this kind of raises the the simple question, but but interesting question of what 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 makes a fake and what's the difference between a fake and a replica um, in terms of deception, in terms of intention of the um, of the creator of the of the of the replica. In this case, the, the fake was meant to deceive and was meant to be created and roughed up to look old and sold to a collector. We're also going to be featuring um, objects from our collection of tourist art, which was spearheaded by Nelson Grayburn. And the object that I really like from this, uh, from this particular part of the exhibit is um, a Haitiki ornament on the left made of jade. Um, this is a Maori object uh, used 
as an ornament to commemorate someone who's passed away. And we're going to be juxtaposing it with a very similar looking object on the right uh, that is made of plastic. And um, that is, um, is a little trinket um, given out by Air New Zealand. So hopefully, if you flew on New, Z New Zealand, Air New Zealand, you will have enjoyed your flight and you will have this cute little trinket of a souvenir to bring with. But, um, but it raises questions, of course, um, about authenticity and about, you know, do we consider this plastic object to be, to be a real representation of this culture? Uh, and our, our way of approaching this is, you know, what, well, first of all, overarchingly, what does real mean? Um, but you know, wh whether or not it's a real representation of Maori culture, it represents a uh, real and interesting um, interaction between uh, Maori culture and, um, and tourism, Maori culture and members of other, um, of other cultures. And finally, our third question, our third um, section, third subsection for the, the exhibit is um, objects from uh, what we call our wastewater collection. And these are uh, objects that were found in an area that was ex excavated in San Francisco during the construction of a wastewater treatment plant um, near North Beach. And the, um, these objects are dated to around 1850 to 1880. And these objects, uh, in terms of thinking about context, we'll be talking about how archaeologists think about context in which objects are found, and also raising questions about uh, the interesting combination of different, of, of, of different origins of objects, these objects being from um, many different parts of the world, many of them um, Chinese American, many of them European American. So raising those questions about, about um, multiple questions of context. And then finally, two of our, one, one thing I forgot to mention, but part of this, this um, of our opening exhibit is that we really want to feature objects that, that have, objects that have not been um, displayed before in the museum, but objects that we're very proud of. And two of those objects, I believe this one may have been displayed before, but it's uh, one of our really fantastic uh, Egyptian coffin sets. And we're going to be, in, in terms of context, we're going to be talking about functional context and how the same sort of life um, process or, or, or life um, what would you say? How, how funerary, funerary practices differ by, by context, by time and place. And uh, so raising this question with this juxtaposition of the uh, Egyptian coffin set with um, another coffin in our collection, which is our um, beloved chicken coffin. Um, and this coffin, I'm not sure, I think some people may have seen this before, but um, this chicken coffin is massive. It's, it's, so it's meant for a person to be buried in. And it's part of a tradition of what, what they call fantasy coffins in Ghana, where people are, um, many people are buried um, in these really fantastic custom-made coffins that often represent the profession or something that is um, beloved by the person who has passed away. So in this case, uh, this, this coffin was commissioned by the museum, but similar ones have been created um, probably for people who are farmers or maybe who um, raise chickens. So um, yeah, so we have this, this, um, this, these two really fabulous coffins that'll be juxtaposed for raising questions about context. So summing up, we've got materiality, authenticity, and context. And, um, and these are just a small fraction of the objects that, um, that are going to be, that are on the list for the exhibit right now. Uh, we're currently honing that and working with our really awesome team of designers to, uh, to make the, the gallery, give it a really exciting and interesting look and feel and to, um, to, make these, to make the exhibit really engaging for visitors in the ways that I've talked about. So now I want to turn to, to you guys and get your take on, on these ideas. And, um, and raise this, this kind of overarching question. This is, uh, I'm, some of you I think may have completed, may have done the survey that we, um, we sent out, we, um, I think back in the fall. But uh, one thing that we're, we want to gather from, from anthropologists and from archaeologists are ways in which we think that everyday visitors might be able to use tools of anthropologists and think like anthropologists. Of course, visitors coming to the museum may, you know, may only be there for um, you know, less than an hour, or maybe just a few minutes, or who knows. But um, but in that short period, how can how can we equip visitors or get them engaging with the ways in which anthropologists think? Uh, and some of the questions that we came up with for this survey that um, I think are really provocative thinking questions are um, 
are this one, for instance. So imagine you're at a dinner party and someone asks you, why is anthropology important today? How would you answer? How do we, what are your suggestions, suggestions and what are your, your feelings about ways in which we, um, we convey that to, um, to visitors who probably either have no idea what anthropology is or they probably think it's about dinosaur bones. So how do we, um, how do we, um, how do we tell that in ways that are um, visitor friendly and that are um, interesting and exciting? Um, some of the specifics, so in your, in your training or in your background, what are some of the specific big ideas of anthropology that you find most important? Um, maybe theories, methodologies, maxims, rules of thumb, different ways of thinking that you think are, um, are sort of bite-sized, that could be made bite-sized for visitors um, to be able to, to grasp and think in a different way. And some of the looking at what are some of the specific skills, tools, or ways of thinking that you gain from your training that you think everyday visitors would be able to use in their own lives and to help their own communities. So what are ways that we can take these ways of thinking and, and make this usable knowledge and usable skills and usable ways of thinking that can have, um, have a, real, um, a real tangible positive outcome for, for visitors. So keeping in mind that, um, of course, that most of our visitors are, are, are not, are, this is probably maybe the first experience that a lot of, a, a lot of visitors have with, um, with real work of anthropologists. So I suppose right now, why don't I kind of wrap up, um, I'll ask you if you have any questions, and then, um, and then I'd love to get your thoughts and feelings about this, about these questions. But um, any questions about, um, about the sort of, what I've talked, anything I've talked about? Yeah. Well, I just want to make sure on, on behalf of my chair here that you get in a word to say before you nail everything down, I hope you don't think of a very increased disability in that yes. place. Yes, we will. We've worked with our museum, uh, apparently didn't. Yes, no, we absolutely will. And that, that's an excusable birthday in this time. Right. No, absolutely. We will be, uh, we're working already. Our, the designers that we're working with are extremely yeah, yeah. Another fellow came up with uh, came up. We had another talk with asking specifically about labels that are uh, having labels that are uh, easy to read or possible to read uh, by people who are visually impaired. So, uh, yeah, definitely something that will be. more about museum experience in general, yeah. thinking particularly about the open museum, which mm -hmm. I really enjoy, yeah. and the things that like transfer between the two. Uh, I've had the experience of taking students to the open museum mm -hmm. as part of a field trip, mm -hmm. and within uh, a class of Berkeley students, having people have opposite reactions to yeah. the, same, uh, the same exhibit design. Students 
sound too cute uh, or, or pandering. And other students said, no, no, this is, uh, this is really interactive and that can feel much more like it's trying to be mm -hmm. So I was curious if you can have that experience of bridging yeah, yeah, it's, um, it is a tricky balance of speaking to multiple types of visitors. You know, a lot of the visitors will be coming to the Earth will likely be student groups, and so, you know, we want to be speaking to them, uh, but we also want to be speaking to, you know, to older things on campus. So, yeah, it's, it's there, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that people do it, and Thank you. 